If you look closely at the muscles here on the cadaver, you'll notice that while they're all made of the same stuff, so various proteins, blood vessels, etc., they have distinct shapes to them. But if you look for long enough, you'll start to notice that despite their differences, they each fall into a specific category of muscle architecture, meaning we can actually group them together based off of the shape they take. Now, these differences in muscle shape come with their own unique consequences in regards to how strong or mobile the muscle is. So in today's video, with the help of the cadavers here in the lab, we're going to investigate the various skeletal muscle architectures and see exactly what it is they do for the surrounding joints, as well as for the overall function of the human body. It's gonna be a really fun one. Let's do this. You are looking at a horizontal or transverse cross section around the mid to upper thigh area of a right lower limb. So you can see the femur, that's this gigantic bone here, and then you can also see a bunch of muscle tissue as well as some vasculature. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kinda peel it apart a little bit, and you're gonna see that as soon as I do this, those muscles are made up of a lot of different muscle fibers. Now, to understand what those fibers are, we need to, like say like if we could zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and get very microscopic, what you'd see is a lot of multinucleated skeletal muscle cells. You could think of those as just really long cells, kind of like a string, that are gonna have multiple nuclei. And the reason why that's important is because you're gonna need multiple nuclei to just help this really long muscle cell survive and thrive, but also if one of those nuclei gets damaged, let's say through some kind of trauma event, the other nuclei will be able to still maintain that cell. So you're not gonna get cellular death, which is extremely important because essentially, for the most part, you're born with as much skeletal muscle as you're ever gonna have. I mean, there are some circumstances with which that changes, but for the most part, that is true. But real quick, I wanna say thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Let's Get Checked. Let's Get Checked offers private, convenient testing in the comfort of your own home. They offer routine blood work, STI tests, and even hormone tests such as a testosterone test. All you have to do is go online, pick a test such as the testosterone test, and they'll ship it to you with detailed instructions so that you can gather the specimen and then ship it back to them with their prepaid label. They even have medical staff on hand so that you can discuss your test results with them. So if you're having libido issues or erectile dysfunction, or maybe you're just curious where your levels are at, go ahead and visit trylgc.com institute, and they'll give our viewers 25% off their very own home test kit if they use the promo code institute25. Link is in the description below. All right, let's get back to it. Now what'll happen is you take those individual muscle cells and then you wrap them in a loose connective tissue that we call endomycium. Now, loose connective tissue just means there's gonna be collagen proteins that are scattered in various directions, but they're not gonna be densely packed. And that's important because that allows blood vessels to go to and from the skeletal muscle cell, as well as you know it allows for movement because inside of those skeletal muscle cells are gonna be the proteins for contraction. So it makes sense that you don't wanna have a lot of tight collagen around the area because there's going to be a lot of friction. Now, if you take as little as 10 of those muscle cells, or maybe somewhere around 100 of them, and you bundle them together into, you know, like just, I like to think of it as like a bundle of firewood. You bundle them together, and then what you'll do is you wrap them in a more dense connective tissue that we call the perimysium. If you do that, you've now created what's called a fascicle. So fascicles, are, again, are just bundles of skeletal muscle cells. Now, if you look at a muscle, you're going to see that it has fiber orientation. What you're looking at are actually groups of fasciculi that are, so you're seeing this, the pathway, the, you know, the, uh, the angle that those muscle fibers are going, those muscle cells. That, those are just groups of fascicles all traveling in a similar direction. That's what dictates the fiber orientation. Now, if you take all of those fascicles and the entirety of the muscle and then you wrap them all together with another dense piece of connective tissue, that we call the epimysium, you now have what we call a muscle. You can now officially name it. So you can say this is the pectoralis major, if you'd like. So just think of muscles as just, you know, it's, it's protein wrapped in connective tissue and more connective tissue, which by the way, the connective tissues are made of protein. So it's protein wrapped in protein wrapped in protein, but it's just a bunch, it's a series of wraps. Now, the next thing that's important to understand are what tendons are and how they relate to muscles. So if we go back to here, so what you're looking at, again, now we're looking at like the, 
that lower leg. So by the way, if you're wondering about the sock, it just helps keep the foot hydrated so it doesn't dry out because we haven't dissected it. But if we look, say, at this muscle here, so this is going to be like the knee. So you're actually looking at the patella here. We're going down, and that makes this the tibia or the shin bone. So you're looking at the front or anterior aspect of the lower leg. If you look at this muscle here, this muscle is called the tibialis anterior. And if we look at it, you're going to see that all of a sudden it transitions into a tendon. A tendon is actually a continuation of the, the connective tissues that were inside and on the outside of the muscle itself. So if you recall me just saying a moment ago, we had the perimyceum that creates the fascicles and then the epimyceum that wraps the entirety of the muscle. Well, what happens is they continue once the skeletal muscle cells are done and they continue on as the tendon and will then blend into bone. So really, really interesting because what this means then is when the proteins of the skeletal muscle cell contract, that'll pull on the endomyceum, which pulls on the paramyceum and the epimyceum. And since those will continue on as the tendon and then blend into the bone, that means the muscle, as it generates tension, it pulls on the tendon, which pulls on the bone, which assuming that you have one bone here and another bone here, and then there's a joint in the middle, you produce a movement. So this is how skeletal muscles produce movement. But another important thing we have to understand is that tendons have there's different sides to the tendon. So I'm actually going to move this leg over here. And what I want to do is I want to look at this. This is a right upper limb. So you can see the hand down here. Then we can see the elbow. You can even see the scapula, which is going to be right here, and then the clavicle. But I want to focus our attention, grab my probe here, to this muscle, which is known as the biceps brachii. So if you're looking at biceps brachii, biceps just means two heads. And you can see that as I split it apart with my probe you can see that we have two heads here, which also means you can see there are two tendons. Let's see if I make sure this is super clear on the camera. So we have two tendons that are going up like this. Then you'll notice down here towards the elbow, there's only going to be one tendon that is then going to insert on the radius. Now, typically, if we were to, like, say if I was teaching an intro to anatomy course, I would say that these two tendons up here are the tendons of origin. These are the origins of the muscle. And then I would say this is the tendon of insertion or the insertion of the muscle. Now, the reason why I say that is only for an intro to anatomy course is because, well, maybe I should say this first. The origin, all that means is this is the less mobile end of the muscle, while the insertion is going to be the more mobile end of the muscle. So I know I'm kind of getting wordy here, but when that means when the muscle contracts, this end moves a greater distance than this end. So let me show you. All right, so the action of biceps brachii is actually, it's going to supinate, so it kind of rotates the palm, so the palm is facing up. And then what it's going to do is it's going to flex the elbow and flex the shoulder a bit. So as it does that action in, the enti in its entirety, more distance is covered at the elbow than up at the shoulder. Therefore, this elbow attachment is considered the insertion. So again, the reason why that's only an intro to anatomy type of understanding is because that's based off of the anatomical position. The anatomical position is a reference point. It's just a way that we can you know, effectively teach anatomy, right? The, the reason why I can say that the head is above the knee is because we're talking about that from anatomical position, right? If you were laying down, then obviously that's no longer true. But the thing is, eventually you get to the point where you have to start talking about human anatomy in more dynamic terms, right? Humans are not just standing in an anatomical position. We are moving all over the place. So let's take a push-up, for example. If I started to do a push-up, right, when I'm doing the push-up, what's now going to happen is my shoulder is moving more or covering a greater distance than my elbow would be. And so, and so biceps is still contracting during this process. And what that then means is we flipped the origin insertion. If the, if the tendons up in the shoulder are moving more, this is now the insertion. And this is moving less down here at the elbow, this is now the origin. So really, when, if you want to be accurate when you're talking about tendons, we really shouldn't be saying origin and insertion. That's just an effective teaching tool. Instead, what we really should be saying is just proximal or distal attachment or superior or inferior attachment or just saying the shoulder attachment or the radial attachment. 
But again, origin insertion do have important functions. So with all that said, now let's see how we can put all this together and start understanding the unique architecture of the various muscles. The reason why you're looking at an anatomical model instead of a face on one of the cadavers here in the lab is because we wanna protect the identities of the cadavers. But also, if you're looking at this anatomical model, you can very clearly see the fiber orientations. This is a very effective teaching tool. So what we're gonna be looking at are two muscles. And these are going to be examples of circular muscles or circular fiber orientations. So the first is going to be this one, which is surrounding the eye. This is called the orbicularis oculi. And it's super cool if you just kind of look at those fibers as it's surrounding the eye and going onto the eyelid. And then the next is going to be the orbicularis oris, which is going around the lips. Now, both of these muscles are essentially sphincters and their job is to protect, you know, the eyes, the mouth from you know, anything going inside of them, right? You're essentially stopping something from going from an external surface into an internal surface. Now the eye isn't directly an internal surface. I mean, I guess it kind of is, but not as internal as say the oral cavity of the mouth, but you still want to protect those delicate tissues. So in the event that say like sunlight or rain or some, you name it, trying to get into the eye, this can very quickly cinch shut, right? And again, you can look at those fibers and just very clearly see how this would just quickly tighten and slam the eye shut. And the same goes for that mouth, right? So you can see orbicularis oris here. You can just picture that would just tighten up, cinch it down, and then nothing's getting inside of that oral cavity. Next up, we have parallel fiber orientations. And as the name suggests, all this means is that the fascicles, those fibers are running in parallel to one another and within the longitudinal axis of that muscle itself. Now I've always taught there being two primary examples of these parallel oriented muscles. But depending on the text, you may see others being included in this. But the first is what we call a strap muscle. And again, to no one's surprise, that's because it looks like a strap. You can think like a towing strap. The classic example is the sartorius muscle. It's the longest skeletal muscle in the body. It runs from the anterior side of the hip all the way down to the medial or inside of your knee. And it's going to produce a lot of range of motion. It's going to swing your hip. It's going to swing your knee. It is a very mobile muscle. It's a very long muscle. And that's because, I mean, for that entire length of the muscle, that's how long those proteins are, the fascicles, the contractile components of the muscle. It's a really, really long muscle. Then you have what's called a fusiform muscle shape. Now, the classic example here is going to be biceps brachii. So a fusiform, you can think of it like a spindle shape. So you, on either end of the muscle, where those tendons are, you're going to have more narrow tendons, right? The, the muscle is actually going to take more narrow appearance, but in the center where that muscle belly is, it's going to be more bulbous. And so what this allows you to do is have a significant amount of muscle mass that is then able to insert in a really small, tight area. And that's exactly what biceps brachii does by especially going into its radial attachment. It's just pushing through this really tight area and hitting that radial tuberosity. It's just a really cool shape. Next, you have the oblique fiber orientation muscles. And so again, to no one's surprise, that's because the fascicles or fibers are going at an angle, at least in relation to the longitudinal axis of that muscle. Now, the first type is what's known as a convergent muscle type. So easy example here is going to be the pectoralis major. And this is such a cool muscle to look at because when you see it, you can see this really wide attachment on the sternum going to the clavicle then all those fibers are just fanning and converging together and then attaching at the humerus at the intertubercular groove. It's just a really cool muscle to look at. It's probably my favorite muscle to look at. Then we have the pennated muscles. So pennate means feather or feather light. And so the first one is called a unipennate. So in this type of muscle, you have a central tendon and then you have a bunch of fascicles that are on one side of that tendon, all coming at an angle. And what'll happen is when they end, those fascicles that is, their connective tissues turn into an aponeurosis, which is a, an aponeurosis is a sheet-like tendon, which will then attach to that more cord-like central tendon. So then what you have is all these tiny little contractions occurring. So the easy example here is extensor digitorum. When you see extensor digitorum, which is in the forearm, it's in the extensor side of your forearm or anabrachium. It's just a, I mean, you have all these fibers just coming at one angle, attaching that central tendon. So what'll happen is they pull, it pulls on that central tendon and you generate movement. The next example is called a bipennate. 
This is the exact same thing as a unipennate, except with a unipennate, all the fibers were on one side. Bipennate, it's mirrored. So now you have fibers on either side of that central tendon. Easy example here is the rectus femoris. It's a quadriceps muscle, so it's gonna be in the anterior side of your hip. And as you can see, there's just this central tendon running down the center, and then you have two side, on either side of it, you have the oblique angle. So again, now what you've done is you've just doubled the amount of protein that you can fit in that space. Then the third type is what's called a multi-pennate. This one is really, really cool because what you have is just fibers just going and fascicles just going in every direction you can pretty much imagine, all pulling on their own little tendons, which are all gonna start converging into one larger tendon. So the easy example here is the deltoid muscle. Deltoid has to do a lot. It has to do flexion of the shoulder, abduction of the shoulder, extension of the shoulder, it's rotating. Deltoid is, it has to do a lot of functions, but the thing to understand is it also has to overcome gravity to do it. It's kind of hard to just lift your shoulder in the way that's needed. So deltoid is obscenely strong because you can fit in a ton of protein by shoving it and going in all these different directions, all pulling on these little tendons which are converging onto one tendon, which will eventually produce one massive movement. Such a cool muscle. So you may be wondering now that we've gone over all these different architectures is why even have them in the first place? What function do they possibly serve? Well, it really comes down to four different things. So first, how much force needs to be applied by that muscle? Essentially, we're asking, how strong does that muscle need to be? Second, how much range of motion is needed at the joint where that muscle is located, right? Some muscles need to produce far more range of motion than others, say like if you're walking versus talking. Third, we have how, well, what's the space look like or the surrounding space, the occupiable space for that area, right? If there's a lot of other muscles and structures that muscle has to fit into, I mean, that's gonna dictate basically how it's going to form. And then fourth, we have attachment sites. How, does it have a broad attachment site or does it have a very narrow attachment site? When you put all those together, that's when you're gonna start seeing these nuanced muscle shapes. But you really also have to think about it in terms of two things, right? Because there's a pro and a con for each. Basically, if you look at the parallel fiber orientations, those are going to be able to produce more range of motion. But if you look at the oblique fiber types, those are going to be able to produce more force. And it really just comes down to how many proteins can you stack or shove into that same amount of space. If you were able to say like make a sartorius or a rectus femoris the exact same length, right? Everything's all equal and then you measured you took a cross section of them and were able to measure how many fascicles essentially are in each, you're gonna see a much larger amount of protein inside of that bipennate, that rectus femoris muscle, meaning it's stronger. Even if they were the same size, you're gonna have a stronger muscle because you're able to apply more force because there's more protein in those oblique fiber orientations. So that's what it really comes down to. Do we need more range of motion or do we need more strength and force? Because you can't have both equally. I mean, well, I guess you could have equal, but sometimes you wanna have a muscle that's stronger and less range of motion, or other times you might wanna have one that has more range of motion, but isn't as strong. And when you put that together and you just like change that in subtle ways all over the body, that's how you're able to get, you know, human locomotion and how we're able to move around and navigate our environment. These muscles have different shapes because we have different requirements for the muscles at different joints for different times. Thanks for watching everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's video. It's always a blast to just nerd out on pure anatomy. As always, be sure to like, comment, subscribe if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you in the next video.